Before starting oral anti-diabetic drugs, I wanted to make a few things clear so that the mechanism of action of these drugs and the site of action is clear and easy to understand. We'll start with the intake of food or starch in this case, which is broken down by alpha-glucosidase in the gut and so that it can be absorbed easily into the blood. Now when glucose is absorbed and it reaches high concentration in the blood bloodstream, what happens is that this high glucose will then go to the beta cells of the pancreas and stimulate the GLUT2 receptors on the beta cells which has a high KM that means a low affinity for glucose and will only attach to glucose when there is very high level of glucose in the blood that is after meals. After the entry of glucose into the beta cell of the pancreas there will be increased ATP production in the beta cell and this increased ATP will then have a blocking effect on the potassium channels in the cell membrane. After blocking the potassium channels this will cause the cell to depolarize and thus cause calcium entry. The calcium entry will then cause a degranulation of previously formed insulin granules in the beta cell and thus insulin will be released into the blood. The presence of food in the gut also stimulates the secretion of glucagon-like peptide 1 which is an incretin that means it increases glucose dependent insulin secretion. But it is a very short lived molecule and is rapidly degraded by DPP4 dipeptidyl peptidase 4 into inactive metabolites. Coming back to the insulin, the insulin after release will then act on various target cells in the body. The insulin receptor has two alpha domains outside the cell and two beta inside the cell. The beta domain has various tyrosine residues. Upon interaction of insulin with this receptor, this the beta sites, the tyrosine uh, residues actually, will be phosphorylated and lead to various responses that are already discussed in the previous video that are specific for insulin um, actions. Similarly, another cascade will go to the nucleus and interact with a specific group of nuclear receptors. Uh, they are proteins actually functioning as transcription factors and regulating gene expression. What they will do is produce proteins or insulin receptors and will increase the number of insulin receptors on the receptor cells. That is, there will be increased insulin sensitivity. They were originally identified in frogs as receptors that induce peroxisome proliferation in cells and that's why the long name. Insulin will also go to the liver and there it will inhibit gluconeogenesis by actually inhibiting the rate limiting enzyme that is fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase enzyme. By inhibiting gluconeogenesis it will control the blood glucose level naturally and decrease it. Insulin also causes the skeletal muscle cells to uptake glucose via the GLUT4 receptor which is insulin dependent and thus lower the blood glucose levels. We know that most of the glucose is freely filtered in the glomerulus but then is reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules. These tubular cells have actually GLUT2 receptors and help in reabsorption of glucose. Apart from insulin, the beta cells of the pancreas also secrete amylin in response to food, which promotes satiety, decreases gastric emptying, and inhibits postprandial spikes in glucose levels. That's all about this figure, but looking at this now, we can actually see that in cases where insulin is not doing its job or there is insulin resistance, then we have many areas looking at this figure we can see that there are many steps that we can actually take over and play the part of insulin without actually administering uh, insulin to the patient but giving oral anti-diabetic drugs. We'll put the drugs on this figure now. First drug that we will use will actually inhibit gluconeogenesis and that will be metformin. It will inhibit the rate limiting step of gluco gluconeogenesis 
that is fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase enzyme. Secondly, we can inhibit the alpha glucosidase in the gut by a drug known as acarbose which will not convert the starch into glucose and thus glucose will not be absorbed into the blood and it will decrease postprandial glucose level. The next class of drugs that we can use are sulfonylureas which will inhibit the potassium channel in the beta cells and thus cause the cell to depolarize and release insulin just as it occurs naturally. Next we can give drugs which are actually agonists or analogs of glucagon like peptide 1 for example exenatide and this will actually work in the place of GLP-1. The next drugs are dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors and thus will increase the half-life of GLP-1. There are also drugs known as SGLT2 inhibitors which are actually the inhibitors of sodium glucose uh, transporter 2 in the proximal convoluted tubules and thus will inhibit the reabsorption of glucose and decrease blood glucose levels. The class of drugs that act on PPAR gamma augmenting it and thus increasing insulin receptors and insulin sensitivity are thiazolidine dions and metformin. Metformin also acts on the gut and decreases glucose absorption. Lastly, we have an amylin analog known as pramlinitide which will decrease gastric emptying and inhibit postprandial spikes in glucose levels. So now that we know where these drugs act and what their mechanism of action is, we'll simplify them by classifying them and studying their important properties and side effects. So the oral antidiabetic drugs that can be used in type 2 diabetes mellitus where the main issue is insulin resistance can be divided into about seven uh, classes. The first class of the drugs are those which will stimulate insulin secretion. So they are known as insulin secretagogues. The second class of drugs will decrease gluconeogenesis by inhibiting fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase enzyme. The third class of drugs will either inhibit glucose uptake from the gut or reuptake from the kidney. The fourth class of drugs are GLP-1 analogs or agonists. Next are dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors. Next are those which bind to PPAR gamma and increase insulin sensitivity. And lastly, we have amylin analog. The insulin secretagogues are further two classes of drugs actually. One is sulfonylureas, while the second class of drugs include a megalitinide analog known as repaglinide and d alanine derivative known as nateglinide. Let's see some properties of sulfonylureas. Now, these drugs will actually need about 30% of functioning beta cells to work because they have to secrete insulin and there needs to be cells to do that. They have a low volume of distribution, that means they have a high blood level of the drug. They are highly plasma protein bound. They can cause hypoglycemia and there can be weight gain. They are also teratogenic, so they should not be given in pregnancy. Some drug interactions of sulfonylureas, the first is with salicylates or sulfonamides which are also highly plasma protein bound and thus will displace uh, these drugs, sulfonylureas, and cause hypoglycemia. Second drug interaction was, is with that of propanolol, same like that of insulin, that it will mask the effects of hypoglycemia and also it will inhibit the glycogenolysis and that is due to the beta 2 receptors as we discussed in the previous video because it's a beta blocker. So there will be delayed recovery from hypoglycemia in this case. Enzyme inducers such as rifampicin and phenobarbitone will reduce its effect by increasing its metabolism.
warfarin and sulfonamides will inhibit its metabolism and increase their plasma level and lead to severe hypoglycemia. The important sulfonylurea drugs are tolbutamide and it doesn't have that much of a risk of hypoglycemia. Chlorpropamide, it can cause hypoglycemia and it also has a disulfiram like action. So you need to remember that it will cause alcohol intolerance. Next is glibenclamide. It will also cause hypoglycemia and is contraindicated in renal patients because it has a, a active metabolite. That's why it has a long action as well. Next is glycoside, glipizide, which is less potent, and glimipride, which is less uh, likely to cause hypoglycemia. And next is repeglinide and nitiglinide. We'll discuss repeglinide first. It is actually preferred in renal patients because it is safe and it has a lower risk of causing hypoglycemia while nitiglinide can cause hypoglycemia. It has a high risk. It also causes weight gain. Now both of them are actually metabolized in the liver so they are contraindicated in hepatic failure patients and they are less potent overall than sulfonylureas. The next class of drugs are those that inhibit gluconeogenesis. The chief drug is metformin which is a biguanide. It has no effect on insulin release. It is well absorbed orally and it does not cause hypoglycemia. The side effects include metallic taste, anorexia, loss of weight, skin rash and a rare but uh, important and serious side effect is lactic acidosis. The next class of drugs are those which will inhibit glucose uptake and reuptake. The uptake is inhibited in the gut by blocking alpha glucosidase as we've previously discussed and the reuptake is by the kidneys and that is inhibited too by inhibiting SGLT2 receptor. The alpha glucosidase inhibitors are acarbose or miglitol and they are given just before food. Metformin also has an action uh, to decrease the absorption of glucose from the gut and therefore can cause vitamin B12 deficiency. Alpha glucosidase inhibitors when taken before food will decrease postprandial hyperglycemia and the spike that is observed because they will inhibit the absorption of course and it is given mainly in obese patients and the side effects will be flatulence, fullness, diarrhea and its hepatotoxic effect is in question. The flatulence, fullness and diarrhea is of course due to malabsorption. The reuptake of glucose in the kidneys proximal convoluted tubule is inhibited by depeliflozin and it will inhibit the SGLT2 receptors. Next we have the GLP-1 analogs or agonists. They include mainly exenatide and liraglutide. And as I previously mentioned, the endogenously produced GLP-1 has a very short half-life of about 1 to 2 minutes and is rapidly degraded by dipeptidyl peptidase 4. So these analogs are actually more resistant to this enzyme and thus are not degraded. They are used as adjunct therapy and they also help prevent progression of beta cell failure and do not cause uh, hypoglycemia but in combination with other uh, anti-diabetic drugs it can. The next class of drugs will inhibit GLP-1 degradation by inhibiting DPP-4. They are citagliptin, sexagliptin and vildagliptin. Citagliptin will competitively inhibit DPP-4 while the other two are covalently bonded to them. They are used as adjunct therapy. They can cause allergies, specifically uh, citagliptin and wildagliptin is hepatotoxic. Overall, these drugs have a low risk of hypoglycemia. Next are the drugs that bind to PPAR gamma and increase insulin sensitivity. They are primarily pioglitazone, which has increased plasma protein binding and it has another special property that it decreases serum uh, triglycerides and also increases HDL. The next is rosiglitazone 
and they are actually thiazolidine dions collectively the side effects are that the rosy glitter zone is not that rosy and it causes cardiovascular events so it is even suspended in some countries generally they'll cause side effects such as nausea vomiting anemia edema weight gain precipitation of cardiac uh, failure and rarely hepatotoxicity sulfonyl ureas and metformin have also somehow found their way into this class and can also increase insulin sensitivity lastly we have an amylin analog to discuss it is pramlinetide it will perform all the functions of amylin and is given subcutaneously before meals it will decrease glucagon secretion delay gastric emptying decrease appetite and decrease weight it can cause hypoglycemia and nausea that's all